Welcome to this conversation with Eileen Shapiro. She's an author, she's a PR expert, and she's booking amazing conversations for me. You must have had, like, you must have had and are still having a really fascinating life. You, you not only, like, know all of these legendary people but you actually have the power to say hey i got a conversation for you to have you're going to give up an hour of your life to talk to somebody nobody knows and they and they say <laughs> sure yeah you know what they all like to do podcasts because number one you know it gets them out there they can promote whatever and number two you never know where you're going to pick up a fan you know like you're in sweden so when I say, oh, someone from Sweden wants to talk to you, you know, they're all in. I'm like, okay. <laughs> it was really funny that Rocky was a little bit afraid that he was going to have to speak Swedish. <laughs> well, he's, he's half there. I mean, he's Norwegian. So. Yeah. But, but I was like, no, I'm not, I'm not from Sweden. I just live in Sweden. <laughs> That's funny. The thing when you really learn another language, you really invest in another language, you kind of forget your first language in a way. Can you speak Swedish? Oh, yeah. Like, I don't know how much how much of a percentage I'd give myself, but I can I can get around. <laughs> That's so cool. And your kids, do they speak both? Oh, yeah. They, since they were in my belly, Morten was speaking to them in Swedish. So they've grown up with both languages. How do you say your last name? Biargvida. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> yeah, I, it took a bit of practice. I probably still don't say it 100% correct. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so, you are an award-winning author and publicist. Is there, but well, there's probably more to your titles and credentials than that, huh? Not really. I'm a journalist. journalist. I think I'm a journalist first. I'm going to take you outside because Don't I actually have my, my grandchildren are here. Oh. <laughs> and uh, actually one of them does a, um, a podcast himself and he, and he gets like 10,000 hits. I mean, he's like huge. So, yeah. Nice. What came first for you? What, what was came first? Um, okay, so I was going to school for nursing, actually, and I was in college, and I had a thing. I really liked Star Trek, okay? And I found a store in New York City called the Federation Trading Post, and the guy that owned it, we became friends, and... I started writing for him. He had a monthly magazine called the Star Trek Giant Poster Book. And then Ballantine Books came to us in Paramount and said, could you do, since you had medical knowledge, could you do a book? So we did the, the, um, the Star Trek, the, uh, what was it called? The Star Trek Medical Reference Manual. It became a bestseller. And I, then I started writing for Star Wars a little bit. And then I, I took like a 30 year break to have kids and raise a family. <laughs> and, and then I just, I started writing for a, um, a huge gay magazine called Get Out Magazine. I, I owned a gay bar. Um, too long of a story, but I owned a gay bar. <laughs> and um, I started writing for Get Out Magazine. First, it was a weekly in print magazine. It still is. And first I did maybe an article a month then one a week, then I became their like sole writer. And most of the people that I interviewed came because of that magazine. And then I wrote another book. I met Jimmy uh, on the Jimmy Star Show. We became friends and opened a PR company. <laughs> so that was pretty much the order. <laughs> <laughs> wow, things just were boom, 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 boom. Mm -hmm. Pretty That's much. So fun. I am. I am a new. I'm a new Trekkie. I've been watching. Um, Morton and I have been watching Next Generation, and before we go to bed, some nights if I'm if I don't have too much editing or whatever to do, and I love it. Data is my my best friend in my head. In my head, you know. <laughs> I love it. 
I can love you it. imagine we, you you've met so many neat people but would you geek out if you were to meet or have you already met any of the actors from star trek oh yeah i met them all they used to be star trek conventions so yeah i, I met them all the original star trek i met everyone chatna leonard nimoy who i had a crush on he was my very first interview i think i was 18 maybe wow. and I got to interview him and I remember sitting on the kitchen floor with a tape recorder. That's how long ago it was. And the call came in and I was so nervous and the interview lasted an hour. And then when I met him, the first thing he said was you. He goes, you were the one with that really lengthy interview. So that, that was my beginning. <laughs> hey, but you, you made an impact. Yeah, I guess so. I, I, at the time, it, I mean, it was like the best thing in life. You know, it still is. Every time I interview somebody new and different and famous, you know, it's it's a big deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so how is it with discovering new talent? How is it with being a, having a PR business? Well, I love all my clients to death. Um, some are new, some aren't. You know, some are already legends. But a lot of them are brand new. And they're talented. They're talented and they deserve to be out there, to be put out there with their music or, or whatever they're doing, whether they're an author or whatever. It's mm. kind of cool. Yeah. Do you think that you you just kind of know? I asked Leland Sklar this when I talked to him the other day. That I, I, I said, I imagine that you, you see a person, you listen to them for like 30 seconds, and you can just kind of tell if they have that secret sauce. Mm-hmm. And I think it may be well, the same I, for you. I have a client called Howard Bloom, and he was the biggest PR person on the planet. He represented everyone from Michael Jackson to everybody. You like, like name of her, Aerosmith, Queen, Prince, uh, Bette Midler, Billy Joel, Alice Cooper, um, Billy Idol, and ZZ Top, and Run DMC, everybody. And he said that, the reason these people became famous was because they had the gods inside of them. So I kind of look for that now, you know, and, and if they don't, they, they can actually acquire it, you know? So, um, yeah, he gave me a really cool thing about him is he's an author now and he's also a scientist and he became a PR guy by accident. And, um, my, my gay soulmate who I love with said, you should interview him. And I was like, I don't know, man. He's like pretty big. Like he was almost intimidating. But I contacted him and he said, yeah. So I interviewed him and then he, he liked the interview so much. He goes, can you represent me? So I was like, yes. The biggest PR guy in the world is asking us to represent him. So that was a cool thing. But um, he only does his interviews at night, though. Otherwise, I would, I would let you talk to him. Hey, I can I can do weird stuff with time if it means talking he's to worth amazing doing, people. He's worth doing something weird for. Yeah. It's just an amazing opportunity. You never know when somebody's going to come into your life and just change things. Like, I never thought that my, me and my little channel, I would have legends to talk to and future potential legends. It's just so cool coolest thing ever and especially if you know that you've had like a part in their lives and all of my clients so far love you so <laughs> so that's a really cool thing when mickey burns said that i was a natural i like wanted to burst into tears like inside like <laughs> if mickey burns told you that he means it he means it because he's been doing this for over 20 years and he He's probably my most professional client as far as interviews and stuff like that because he's so used to it. He's mm. done it so many times. Um, I, I was on his show and I was actually scared. I was actually nervous. <laughs> but it was fun anyway. He was the most fun person to interview in that he was able to let the conversation go. Just It felt smooth. It didn't feel like... Oh, I have the script to go through. Yeah, I hate those awkward little spaces where nobody says anything, but but he's good for that. He's good for that. He um 
he doesn't let that happen because he's so used to it. And he's had really tough people to interview. And I know because I've given them some, number one. And number two, I've interviewed them myself. And, you know, they, they were hard. And we, we always compare we're like, oh, did you interview this one? This one's really hard. Um, and he's and, and, you know, he'd say, well, I did interview that one. Or, or he asked me to interview somebody that he didn't. And he'd give me certain things that he had a problem with. And I would not have that problem. I would have a different problem. So it's kind of cool. It's kind of cool to compare notes in a good way. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like back myself into a corner like, oh, no, there's space. I give myself space like, OK, I'm not quite sure where to go. I'll just look at some notes. I'll try to formulate a thought. And people have been really gracious while I formulate thoughts mm -hmm. and, and kind of figure out a point to go. It's fun. I, I've always loved people and I've always loved talking to people. And I think with a lot of things like you want to do something, but you think, oh, it's going to, whatever I do, whatever I want to do with my life, it's probably going to be really hard. But like your superpower is what you love. It is what comes naturally. I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. And you, and you are a natural. You're, um, I knew that when I spoke to you originally that you'd be, I had no problem. Like I knew you'd be good. So <laughs> that was very fast, a very fast conversation we had. <laughs> but you know, it was a good one. I could tell right away who can interview and who can't. Mm. I can't. And you know, everyone deserves the chance to try, but when you got it down, that's like 99% of the battle. Yeah, just. And the 1% is the technical stuff. But you know, like who thought, like I'd be looking at you, talking to you, like you're in Sweden. <laughs> You're like six hours ahead of us or something. <laughs> You're like a whole nother time zone, a whole nother universe. I think that's so cool. It really is. You're like, you're like in our future. <laughs> like if I can use you for lotto numbers, I mean, that would be good too. But <laughs> yeah. Talk to an Australian. They really are in the future. Yeah. I, I have one or two Australian clients that, you know, come back and forth. And um, I mean, they're, they're, I have an Indonesian client. Um, that I, I think I might have even scheduled a few sheets. They're like 24 hours or something. I mean, it's crazy. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> they're like on another day. I think that's so weird. I love it. Who is? Who are some people who've made some lasting impacts on your life? Well, I got to start with Leland, of course, because, I mean, he's such an icon. The thing is, I met Scott Page at a party from Pink Floyd and I met him at a party and we were leaving. It was an Oscar party and myself and Jimmy and Ron were leaving. And then all of a sudden Jimmy said, Hey, do you want to meet someone from Pink Floyd? I was like, uh, yeah. And within five minutes, he put his phone number in mine. He said, call me tomorrow. You know, I asked him for an interview. He said, call me tomorrow. And I was like, holy shit. So I did. I called him the next day and we became very, very close friends. And through this whole pandemic, we, we actually FaceTime at least once a day, sometimes more. And I needed more people to put on shows. So I said, Scott, you have to take out your little black book and give me all your friends. I need to steal them. And he did. And one of them was Leland. And when, when I got Leland, I honestly had never heard of him. And he said, Eileen, this guy is big. He's huge. He's an icon. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Scott always talks really well about everybody. He's very positive. But he was right. <laughs> I mean, I went to a party where I met Leland just recently. I went to L.A. and we did a big, huge red carpet thing. And he came so that we'd meet because we had never met. And when he walked in, the other rock stars, like from Guns N' Roses and stuff like they were like practically bowing like the Messiah walked in. So I have to say Leland made an impact on my life. Um, Scott, of course. And, um, oh God, there's so many. Almost everyone I speak to makes some kind of impact on my life just because of the fact that, that I spoke to them. I mean, Annie Lennox, who speaks to her. Um, Fred Schneider from the B-52s. He actually became a good friend and you know now he hangs out with us. So him... Um, my partner, Jimmy Starr, of course, because he's, he's just like me. He's the boy version of me. <laughs> oh God, there's so many, there's just so many. 
um, all of my clients have impacted my life in, in, in some way. Rocky and uh, April Rose. And I, I worked with a guy, a guy named John Belesco, who was, I, I think I scheduled him for your show. And if not, I will. But he's like the biggest uh, music publisher on the planet. And he used to manage Tina Turner and, and stuff like that. So he's a pretty big impact. You know what? I could just I could talk to you for about six hours on people that influenced me. So, <laughs> I believe it. Oh, so you so you met Jimmy Starr, and how long between meeting him did you decide let's start a business together? About a year. About a year. We became friends after I was on his show, and he, he used to live in Pennsylvania. So he, he came him him and his husband came out the very next week, and we hung out and we just became friends. And then one day I decided that, you know, we were having a, a problem with one of the PR people that we both um, knew. Um, she put people on his show and, and she also gave me people to interview when we were having a problem with her. And we decided that she was like anti PR. So we decided, you know what, we have more contacts than any PR person from journalism and from the people he had on this show. And they all charge like a huge amount of money Let's just not charge a lot just so we can continue doing what we're doing and, and still eat. Let's charge a nominal fee and, and see what happens. And within a year, we, we had all these huge clients. And, and, you know, we still charge a very little fee, very, very small. But we have so many clients, you know, it doesn't matter. Because it's more about the relationship than about mm -hmm. squeezing money out of people. Well, for us, it is because, you know, we become friends with all these people. There's not one client that I have that I can say that I'm not friends with, you know, that doesn't call me at, at three in the morning if they have to. Hmm. So, yeah. just, I, when, when, when I mention your name and I'm like, it's just so cool that Eileen made it possible for us to have this talk and everyone just lights up like, oh, Eileen, you know, <laughs> they really trust you and they really care about you as much as you care about them. Yeah, I know. I, and I know that. I know that it's a very mutual friend, great vibe thing. I've never, I've never really had a problem. Um, I mean, I, I think out of all our clients, there's maybe one or two that didn't come back, but it's because either they couldn't afford it or because they didn't have anything new to promote. So, yeah. I mean, we have the same clients from whenever we started, however long we started. So that's kind of cool. How long have you been doing this thing? You know what? We were trying to figure it out the other day. I think it might be going on five years. I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> you know, we, we've both been doing our thing separately for I think Jimmy's 15 years and I'm about the same but I think we got together about five I want to say five years ago but I, I don't like don't hold me to it because I could be lying so <laughs> <laughs> it's it's so interesting in my imagination I just kind of see you guys being kind of these I, like you kind of go under the radar maybe for a lot of people but the but like your but your tight knit community doesn't really care. Like I don't know. I, does that make well? Any you know what? Like like I said, we're both we both do our own thing. He has the show, and he it's the biggest internet show. He has some um, I think five million people, and I write for 80, 87 now eighty seven publications. So people know us in our own field. Yeah. Aside That's from PR. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, you can't know everybody, <laughs> but you know what? The thing, my, my theme and his theme is if it's fun, we're going to do it. If it's not fun, we're not doing it. So, yeah. Oh, that is so cool. What a fascinating life. You know what? It's a fun life, you know, and it keeps, just keeps getting better. Even with the pandemic. I mean, we met so many great people because of the pandemic. Um, and, you know, it, it honestly, it, it didn't hurt our business. It probably helped our business because people wanted to stay relevant and all people could do was read or watch or listen. Mm. So we were pretty good. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad that everything's opening up now. I think that's so cool. So when I, when you think of, when I hear the word PR work, 
my I go my brain goes to like TV shows and movies where you have to like do damage control when some scandal comes up and things like that. Is that is that a big part of your work? We have some of that. <laughs> we we do have some of that. Um, but I mean, mo most of our clients, we tell them, listen, stay away from politics, stay away from religion, and you're cool. And most of them listen to us. I mean, we've had some instances where we've had to be like, oh, what do we do now? But I mean, everything that happens blows over if you don't make a big deal out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, someone says something um, that they shouldn't have said, okay, fine, you made a mistake, apologize, and then don't talk about it. You know, you, so. Makes me think but of. Yeah, we've, like, we've had some. You could have you could have done some favors for Sia back when she just kept digging and digging about her autistic movie that was just had a lot of problems. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Stop talking for the love of mud. <laughs> exactly. You know what? Just go on with your life. You know, but you know what? Sometimes in the PR business, this is not we don't we don't do it but sometimes in the pr business you like to make a scandal just to bring attention oh uh, i don't feel like i don't feel like we have to do it because i think that our clients bring enough attention <laughs> but um i mean we've had clients that have done things that were dumb really dumb but you know there was always a way there's always a way to fix it as long as you're alive it can be fixed mm -hmm. <laughs> So. so is that a fun challenge to not know what's going to happen and not know what fires will need to be put out? Most of the time we have a heads up. Um, uh, there are more fun challenges like finding people that want to interview our clients. And, but I have clients that I, they don't tell, like they don't tell me. Uh, Leland, for example, <laughs> he's, he released a single Friday. Um, and I'm like, well, you're releasing a single, don't you probably think maybe I should know about it? Oh, yeah. You know, like they're very lax. But, um, you know, and other ones can't wait to release their singles. And, and, and every day, be, a month before they talk to us, they, they, can you do something about the single? Can you? So, I mean, it, 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 it's personalities, of course, always. So every personality is, is a challenge. Every conversation can, has the potential to change a life, a mind, a person. So, yeah, I mean, but like I said, it's fun. We have fun. You know, even the, even the bad things, we just make sure we have fun. Well, you know what? You're a great interviewer, and this is a lot of fun, and I, my clients all really, I have to say it again, really, really like you, you know, and that's important. That's important. Um, it's, it's, it makes me feel so good. Like it's not work. It, I mean, editing can feel like work, <laughs> but yeah, I bet the, the opportunity to talk to people, like there was this thing I was doing until COVID happened and we had to, you know, stop. But what we would do is we would do free foot care for people, for the poor people in the area. And I would have to be speaking Swedish the entire time. And I would really, my brain would really turn to mush, but, you know, letting, having, putting their feet in the buckets of warm soapy water and shaving off the dead skin and massaging lotion and that was this time that I had to have one-on-one -on -one Swedish conversations with people. And like the very, the very beginning, I was like, oh yeah, feet, they're a little weird. Eh, but oh well, I got over it. I pushed it back and it just like, feet are normal. Everybody's got them. They all looked, they all looked weird and just went on with it. But I missed that when it was stopped was to be able to have that chance to really connect with people like that. That's such a cool thing. That's such a cool thing. So, sorry. Speak a little Swedish for me. Ah, uh, what can I say? Do you get the Kitty? I come from USA. You get YouTube. Uh, they are they are roll it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, anyone that can speak another language, I really, really admire. I mean, I had French in high school, and I I I just passed, but. But I have to say this, it, it does stay with you. When I went to uh, to Paris, 
you know, I, I was able to read the signs and shit. So that, that was good. That was kind of cool. And um, uh, I went to Montreal. That was the worst, the worst experience I ever had. I went to Montreal to see a Billy Idol concert. And they needed directions and no one would speak English there. No one. And they all knew English. They just wouldn't. So, I mean, I knew enough French at least to find out where I had to be. But it was still so annoying. Like, I know you speak English. You know, you're Canadian. Okay, you're French Canadian, but I know you speak English. So I'm like, come on, give me a little English. And they wouldn't. Not and, at all. And Quebecois is like bizarre French. It's like Fr how French yeah. was in the 1800s that never evolved. Mm -hmm. It's true. That's true. When I heard Quebecois after I had kind of been in kind of like once you're in France, you have no choice but to learn really well, learn really fast because, you know, they will not speak English with you. So I was sort of understanding things. And when I heard that, I just wanted to laugh the entire time because it sounded so silly. Well, you know what? I didn't have a problem in France. Everyone I, that I dealt with spoke English. And mm -hmm. once they found out that we were American, you know, a lot of people say France doesn't like Americans. I did not find that. They were just so nice to us. Yeah, um, I, I had wonderful we had experiences in France, really loving, gen genuine people. Yep, I had that same experience. Yeah. And the thing is, I, I I used to go to England a lot before COVID because I have clients there. And um, I had more trouble in Scotland than I did in Paris. Like the, the poor Scottish girl had to write down directions for me because I guess she got, got tired of me saying, excuse me, <laughs> excuse me, can, can you repeat that? So she finally wrote it down. But I had more problems in, in Scotland than I did in France. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I was in Ireland for my very first tour when I because I came to Europe on my 21st birthday. I was with a Christian theater company and we did tours of four and a half months at a time. So I spent my first four and a half month chunk in Ireland. And those were some difficult accents on the phone sometimes. See, Ireland, I've been to, and I, I, I write for a bunch of Irish magazines. I, I don't have a problem with that, I guess, because I'm used to I'm used to it. But I, it seems like I never really had a problem with, with Ireland or England. I was used to the, England, the British accent. You know, now I can tell if they're from Manchester or London or Liverpool, because their accents are a little bit different. Like, like in America, if you go down south, it's like a different world, you know, that some of them you can't even understand You're like what <laughs> but um so yeah i mean accents are fun languages i i can't do accents i'm okay i can understand i'm pretty good at that but um <laughs> yeah. but when you interview someone and you transcribe it sometimes it comes out different than you think it did and i remember i interviewed adam ant and he was like my all-time favorite in life that i had to interview and it took me six years and I finally get in and I had met him many times but I finally get this interview and they all said we'll give you a half hour but if he likes your questions he'll go further if he doesn't like your questions he's going to cut you right off and I'm like oh god so we wind up talking an hour and then I wind up cutting him off because I didn't have any more questions but when I transcribed it you know he was he was very kind he said um there's a couple of grammatical errors and I was like, oh, okay. What he meant is I didn't understand what he said, but he was like nice about it. And I, I wound up having to send it to a friend. Um, she, she's from New Zealand, but she lived in England. And I, I wound up having to send it to her. And she helped me out a little bit. It was a, you know, he speaks like a soft cockney. And you think you understand him. And, and you do while you're talking to him. But when you go back and listen, it's a little tough. I remember doing a play with the girl who was Scottish. Well, there was a whole bunch of us and it was a very difficult play with really, really wordy play with a lot big cast. So we had to, it had to be had snappy dialogue and the Scottish girl, I had, I had to stop the rehearsal just to say, can you please repeat the, it a little slower? I can't understand what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, I believe that. I do. I do. It's really, really interesting talking to people from other cultures, though. Like, mm -hmm. I got so many perspectives I never would have gotten. Like, talking to people my age who grew up shortly after the wall, the wall came down, German kids who talked about the perspective of it not being that great for them. 
Like there was a lot of things that got worse for people. And we have this American perspective that doesn't match the rest of the world sometimes. It doesn't. Totally. Totally. There are some things that I would never have known. Never. And I mean, even in America, if you go like from New York to California, it's like it might as well be a different country. <laughs> I mean, they're just so different than uh, the New Yorkers. And it's, it's, you know, it's cool in a way, but it ta- does take getting used to, yeah. you know, like people in L.A. are so laid back. I mean, you know, like when they're crossing the street, like they just they don't even look. They just cross. And <laughs> like, oh, my God, you're going to die. But <laughs> no, it's a whole it is a different world. Well, I grew up in this little bubble in Utah, and I remember that my, my huge culture shock in Southern California was like going into a McDonald's and myself and my team, we were three, three young people were wearing more clothes between the three of us than everyone else in the entire place. <laughs> I can't even imagine what it's like in Utah. I just know it's pretty there. But you're the first person I ever met from Utah, and I think that's cool. That is cool. Utah, yeah. Where I've come from is Ogden, and Ogden's gone through quite a lot of changes since I was a kid to today. Like, it used to kind of just be kind of, you know, gangs, the influence of the kids, come people coming from California and Mexico, and like kind of not not the greatest reputation and now like gentrification is a huge thing and there's like a lot more culture like before there was a lot more mormons and 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 now there's more hippies and and musicians and music festivals and yeah there is i know but the thing is when you think of utah i mean the first thing you think of mormons Mormons and and then you want to ask well how how many wives do you have i mean (laughs) so yeah yeah it used to be part of my introduction i'm i'm katie i'm from utah i'm not mormon (laughs) that's funny that's funny you know we have um amish the amish people up here Mm -hmm. and they're very different um really different and upstate new york you see them a lot and you always like have to it's terrible you have to stare at them because it's so different and you know you you know i don't i don't stare at them because you know, I, I think they're bad or it. I want to know more. I want to know what kind of life they had, you know? That it's curiosity, so I think that curiosity must be a staple of somebody who wants to have conversations with people. It's like, I don't mm-hmm. like the word interview. It sounds so professional. It's like, I don't ever want anyone talking to me to feel like they're being handled or I'm trying to get the juiciest thing out of them. I want to just have a conversation. Just conversation. That's yeah. what I call them. When, when I, when I tell my clients, I don't say interview. I say, well, you're going to have a conversation with such and such. Yeah. And you know, some of them, some of them ask, well, what's it about? What does it matter what it's about? Just go with it. You know, I never give them a heads up or a warning. <laughs> um, they know that already, you know, if they want to look up the show themselves and, you know, that's up to them. I don't give them links. They ask for links and I'm like, I don't know how to do links. So you're on your own, <laughs> but I have never had anyone say, Oh my God, I hated that show. Never. You know, some Scott will, Scott usually, um, will tell me, you know, this show is this way because of that. And, you know, he'll, he'll critique it, not in a bad way, but he'll, He'll critique it. Leland loves them all. He says, oh, they're all great. I don't know if, you know, they are, but a lot of, a lot of, a lot of times I don't even speak to to the people. They just contact us and we go with it, you know, (laughs) like like if they're not murderers or or crazy people, we go with it. So (laughs) if Scott has any, any critique for me, will you let me know? I will. He liked you though. He said it went very well and he liked you a lot. Great. <laughs> and Leland really liked you. And um, yeah, everyone, no one said anything bad. Everyone really, really, I, I should, I'll send you some of the comments just so you oh. can have them for your resume. Uh-huh. I'd love that. I'll, I'll screenshot them and send them to you. Cool. Well, if there's anything else that you'd like to share or say, I know you're a busy, busy lady writing for 5 billion things. So I have no idea when you sleep or do anything else. <laughs> I know. But I'll tell you what, I think that you're very interesting too. And, and I discussed, we're going to, you and I are going to have a little conversation 
for a magazine or something. So maybe next week in between everything. That'd be great. I'd love that. And, and thank you very much for your time and for talking to all my people and for talking to me. I love it. Thank you. So the way that I end my conversations is I give hugs. Hugs. Oh, <laughs> I love hugs. Me too. Total I, I miss hugs so much. <laughs> well, you, you have the cutest little babies to hug. So yeah, I do. They're, they're absolutely beautiful. <laughs> and every every time they come on the screen, people are like, oh, my God, they're so cute. So cute. All right. Well, thank you so much again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.